It's Friday, July 16, 2010, and welcome to This Week in Linux News. On Monday, Spotify announced the release of their desktop application for Linux. They can't quite figure out how to get the apps to display properly though, so it's only available for subscribers. So basically, if you're a Linux user, you live in one of the seven European countries where Spotify works, and you're actually subscribed to it, this is a great day for you. I'm very pleased for all four of you. On Thursday, July 15th, OpenSUSE 11.3 final released. With this comes quite a few new features that I didn't see in my Milestone 7 review, such as netbook support, including a new Plasma netbook workspace that's supposed to make it look and feel a whole lot nicer, possibly even a lot more lightweight for netbooks. They've included a Mego desktop interface that you can use on your laptops or netbooks. They've also added smartphone support for Androids, iPhones, and Blackberries integrated into Banshee, Rhythmbox, and just Nautilus, respectively. They've added the Spider Oak application to allow online backup and synchronization for free. They've added experimental support for the ButterFS file system. And just for good measure, they went ahead and added an LXDE desktop environment. There are, of course, tons more new changes other than that, but feel free to go to their website and check it out. Links will be in the doobly-doo. In some web browser news, Firefox 4's Beta 2 Preview is showing they've got an application tab now. Basically, you can take any tab that you use on a regular basis, right-click on it, and say, make this an app tab. And you'll get, instead of having the full tab that you can go back to and reload, you'll have a button that'll show up, the fav icon for it, that you can go back and click. Not sure exactly how useful that is, but I'm definitely going to download it and try it out. People over at the Wine Project had a big week this week, releasing their RC7 a version 1.2, and actually releasing 1.2's final version. This version comes with over 23,000 changes. So now I'm going to name them all off to you one at a time. I hope you have a couple of years. No, I don't have the time for that, and neither do you. The main changes come with 64-bit application support if you're on a 64-bit system. All new graphics based on the Tango standard, over 3,000 new bug fixes, and they've also worked on some more desktop integration, Direct3D, and a whole lot of other stuff. Again, release notes will be in the doobly-doo. On Thursday, Pharonix posted an article on how Intel can't even ship the driver for their own chipset on their Mego OS. Basically what happened is Intel outsourced the production of the Pools Bow chipset and the driver and everything, and now they can't get the driver as anything but a binary because of licensing issues. Awesome. Of course, Intel's solution to it is just to make a newer, better graphics chipset, but for the people with the laptops that already have that, it really doesn't help out all that much. Moving right along, Google's been busy yet again. They've created a new web application called Google App Inventor that allows people, students in particular, to create Google Android apps just by clicking and dragging on a website. They don't have to do any code by hand. It's still in a closed beta at this point, but if you go to their website, you can actually register to try it out. In a little bit of Ubuntu news, Ubuntu Software Center 2.1.5 released, and now it supports plugins. That said, there are no plugins available at this time. Not really sure what the plugins are going to do. There are various and sundry other graphical changes to it, but not really that much else. Hopefully the plugins work similar to the way that Firefox and Chrome treat their extensions. The new Software Center is going to be available in 10.10, .10, and they're working on a PPA for 10.04 if you'd like to try it out eventually. And let's wrap up with some phone news. As I mentioned before, the Droid X released on July 15th. Now, Verizon was prepared for this. They had tons of units pre-ordered, and apparently they ended up selling out in a lot of places anyway. Now, the problem with this, the second story involved, is actually that Motorola has included a ROM lockdown on the Droid X. So if you try to tamper with it in some way or install some hack firmware on it, it will actually brick the device. So what does this mean for you? Basically for a lot of people it doesn't mean all that much, but if you like to do custom firmwares, if you like to hack around on your device, you might not want to look at the Droid X just yet. That said, I'm sure somebody will come up with a way to get around that given enough time. Speaking of phones, Google's decided they're going to halt sales of the Nexus One. They just got a batch of Nexus Ones in, and this is the last one that you'll be able to see. After they've stopped selling it, of course, they're going to be back in channels you'll still be able to get them from, but through the mainstream, it's not going to be available. Now what does this mean? Is Google actually going to just stop selling phones entirely, or are they working on something new? I would love to see a new Google phone. The, the Nexus One itself is actually so far ahead of the game when it came out. I'd love to see where they go with it next. I, I would foresee like a 1080p camera, and like a 17 billion pixel display, and uh, 17 LED flash, and all sorts of fun stuff like that. I'd like to see it turn into a little transformer and do a dance for me as well. Google, if you're watching, keep that in mind. And this last little bit of news is just a fun article I found on thenextweb.com which says that if you put your Android phone into a night vision mode with a certain application, you can gain a ton of extra battery life out of it. So basically, if you're willing to cripple your device temporarily and put it into like an all red, an all green, an all blue, purple, whatever mode, where the screen itself looks a different color, you could almost double your battery life by doing that if you'd really want to have one or two colors on your screen at a time. It's a really interesting article and they've got a video showing it in action if you'd like to see that. I will put a link to that, where? In the doobly-doo! 
As a bit of an update to the earlier story, it turns out that the Motorola Droid X lockdown, it's a lockdown, but it's not a 100% this will brick your device if you do something to it. It's more of a soft mod, so it's not really that big of a deal. The hackers are going to get around it in a matter of time. Sorry about that, I'm correcting my earlier self, so shame on you, Jordan, for not getting 100% of the facts. That's all I've got for you today, though. Thank you for watching. I will see you next time.